Hello, comrades. Right. So we uh we back for another uh reading of Ajibwa Ajibwa Warrior by Dennis mm -hmm. Bank. Uh we've been learning about the uh, American Indian movement, uh how it started, what was the inspiration to it. I think a lot of us been getting a lot out of this uh, reading of, uh, of this organization, this movement. And uh, as a lot of people know, we have a, a member of uh, we have a member organization of the American Indian Movement that's a part of the Second Rainbow Coalition. We have the Woodland uh, e uh, Northeast Woodland Chapter of A that's a part of us. So this is this is why we study, because we have to understand how these comrades are even here with us today fight the same mm -hmm. fight we fight today you know what i mean so uh with that said we always start off with the statement of unity for the second rainbow coalition so i would like love for my comrade gabby uh to jump into that for us thank you comrade kwame um we'll be starting with the preface of the um of the um of the statement of unity so the preface, the US was founded as a colonial settler state based upon white supremacy and slavery, stealing the lands of the indigenous nations, breaking every treaty made with them and uh, confining them to reservations, concentration camps. As the country became more powerful, the eagle sank, sunk its claws into the other nations, making war on Mexico and grabbing its Northern territory invading Cuba, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, and the Philippines, and either annexing them outright or, or making them colonies or neo-colonies. In the 20th century, it became the major um, imperialist power in the world, exploiting both the people within its boundaries and those um, in every other country, bullying them with military interventions and robbing them of their right to self-determination. As Huey P. Newton stated, we have two enemies to fight, racism and capitalism. Between the two, capitalism is primary. Racism is a, pri is a byproduct of capitalism. The working people of the world, of every ethnicity or nationality, face a common enemy that is destroying life on Earth. Our enemy is a small ruling class of property owners controlling most of the world's wealth and resources. We must have our basic needs met to live a good and meaningful life. Food, shelter, health, health care, education, freedom from oppression by the state, and peace with other nations. To obtain these essential things for life, we must have the power to see to it that the abundance that is available is shared equitably. Statement of Beauty for the Second Rainbow Coalition. The legacy of the Rainbow Coalition dates back to its founding on April 4th, 1969, by the original Black Panther Party, original Young Lords and Young Patriots organization. A number of other organizations joined the coalition not too long afterwards, such as the American Indian Movement, Brown Berets, Rising Up Angry, the Red Guards, and others. Since the founding of the United States, the masses had developed a number of popular movements that came together to fight back against the capitalist imperialist system in various, um, in various ways, around particular demands. Nevertheless, none had established a movement quite like the first Rainbow Coalition. The historic movement was, was the first of its kind that established a model of class struggle like no other. Its charismatic leader, Chairman Fred Hampton of the Illinois chapter of the original Black Panther Party, stated that at the end of the day, we weren't engaged in a quote-unquote race struggle, he said. It's a class struggle, goddammit. By uniting with the various oppressed ethnicities and masses, they were able to bridge the gap between the various ethnic communities that white supremacy had long sought to keep divided. The class solidarity equipped them with the material basis and class consciousness to see their common class um, condition. Therefore, the necessity to form a united front against their common class oppressor, the capitalist imperialist ruling class. The ruling class viewed this as the greatest threat to their class rule and subsequently used the entire repressive forces of the state, police, courts, jail prisons, and intelligence agencies, etc., in order to crush the emerging revolutionary socialist movement. We refounded the Rainbow Coalition on May 14th, 2021, with the intent of upholding the legacy of the original Rainbow Coalition. 
we believe that this historic example is the model um, is the model for the united front that will best serve our class liberation. By upholding the template program of the original Black Panther Party, which was subsequently adopted and later expanded by the original Young Lords, Young Patriots Organization, and all other original Rainbow Coalition members, we established a pragmatic unity. The six disciplinary rules that we uphold um, ties all organizations in our coalition to a common professional discipline. History has bestowed upon our generation a common class mission to fulfill. The, represent the representatives of the capitalist imperialist ruling class, re represented by the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, cannot liberate us. It is in their class intention and interest to uphold our common class oppression. Therefore, it is only we, the oppressed masses of all ethnicities and nationalities, who must build the necessary class solidarity, class consciousness, organizational structures, and a united front that will ultimately liberate ourselves. This is what the Second Rainbow Coalition is committed to. This is a historic mission we intend to fulfill. There to struggle, there to win. All members of the all members of the coalition, New African Black Panther Party, White Panther Party, New Party of New um, Green Party of New Jersey, Poor People's Army, La Massa Nacional de Brambres, de Brambres, Fury, Feminist Uprising to Resist Inequality and, and Exploitation, NASO, North Alabama School for Organizers, um, New Era Young Lords, Guardian Rebellion, and American Indian Movement, um, NE Woodland Chapter. The six disciplinary rules. Number one, members will conduct themselves in a manner to bring credit to the coalition and will treat others with respect and politeness. Number two, members will be sober when on Rainbow Coalition business and will not engage in any criminal activity while a member. Number three, no member will, will engage um, in violence except in the extremity of self-defense. Number four, members will not gossip nor be divisive to the unity of the Second Rainbow Coalition. Number five, Members will not act as informers nor work against the purpose of the Second Rainbow Coalition. And number six, nobody authorized to speak for the Second Rainbow Coalition unless authorized to do so. And that is the same of you. All right. Appreciate that, comrade. Uh, you're welcome. Before we uh, jump right in, uh, and uh, you're going to be at a screen share, uh, Zim. Okay. Uh, before we jump into that, uh, I want to, you know, uh, send a special shout out to the La Mesa uh, National de, de Brown Berets. They're out there in California uh, having a conference out there. Uh, it's going to be tomorrow. Uh, appreciate those comrades. Uh, they showing the solidarity and unity of what the Second Rainbow Coalition is about. Uh, mm -hmm. with how they're demonstrating with the uh, Brown Berets and stuff. You know what I mean? So uh, mm -hmm. I hope all those comrades have a good conference out there. Be safe, you know, have a good time and just enjoy being a revolutionary. You know what I mean? It's not always uh, serious all the time. They're going to have fun as well out there. So uh, I miss all those comrades, but I know they're doing something very important and special. So uh, salute to them. Uh, so with all that power. said, Absolutely, y'all. Prior to the people, uh, with that said, uh, oh, and uh, I want to uh, uh, let everyone know uh, that tonight I know uh, people on here uh, will be able to hear this, uh, but my wife is gonna be uh, giving an interview, and it's gonna be a big interview. She's uh, gonna be on there with Gabby Petito's uh, father. Uh, I know y'all heard about that missing uh, girl down in, uh, uh, woman down in uh, Florida that came up missing and stuff like that that was all I over the news. Uh -huh. Oh, I just, I didn't hear about that. Actually, what happened? Uh, well, she, uh, Vince, uh, long story short, uh, her boyfriend killed her, but they thought they didn't know oh for God. sure where she was buried at and all this other stuff, but it was all on all the news stations and stuff like that. So uh, this is a good opportunity to uh, for Katrina. She's also going to be on there with Jessica Nunez and one other person that's hosting it. He's a geologist. His son or something is missing. I forget his name. <laughs> but this will be a good opportunity to get the story of my wife's uh, sister 
out there on a big, big, big platform. Like this is a huge platform. So um, definitely share that tonight uh, if y'all can, if uh, she posted it to our Facebook page. Uh, but anyway, with that said, we're going to jump right into the American Indian Movement with Dennis Banks and then uh, have a great discussion as we always do. Uh, give me just a moment. I'm trying to get the page to load. I believe we were at like 156 or 157. Okay. And my computer's being a little slow here loading the PDF. <laughs> um, sister um, Zen, if you are unable to load it, I will happily um, I will happily screen share and read along. I've, I've got it now. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, I just got to scroll a couple more pages. <laughs> okay. Apparently, apparently what, what it says as far as the page number and the little ticker at the bottom is not the same as the actual page number in the PDF. So. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, do you, you got the actual book? Um, no, I've got the PDF that you sent me, but for some reason, the PDF reader was showing 157 on what was actually oh, page yeah, like yeah. 145 of <laughs> right, right. the book. Yeah. And it's like, wait a minute. All right. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I know um, that. Know this. There we go. All right. Pop back in Zoom here. I love, I love uh, your animation, DeMarley. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you got something. You had to do that. <laughs> oh, that's cute. I really like that. Yeah, I never even knew you could do that. Just go to the bottom of your screen where it says more. Uh huh. And you click on those three little buttons. And when it says background and effects, click on uh -huh. that. Choose your okay. avatar. Uh, avatars. Okay. Okay. Got you. I'm in there now. All right. Uh, we're about to jump right into chapter 13. A uh, place called Wounded Knee. It says, before A, our young people lived in despair. They drank themselves to death. They're, they were ashamed to be Indians. Some committed suicide. At Wounded Knee, they became warriors again and began to feel good about themselves. They began to, uh, to feel good about being Sioux, Sh Cheyenne, or Ojibwe. They put on red face paint, let their hair grow long, and proudly wore their ribbon shirts. Under fire, they learned to respect themselves once more. And after almost 100 years, they were ghosts dancing again. All right, let me turn my screen to the side so I can read better. The days after the dis disastrous confrontation at Custer, were for me days of soul searching and deep thinking. Who is Dennis Banks? What is AIM? What is the person called? What is that person called an Indian? There were so many questions to answer. About February 15, 1973, I was in Pierre, Saint, uh, South Dakota, the state capital, addressing the state legislator at the invitation of Governor Kennep about racism in South Dakota. I told them that I felt the situation at Pine Ridge had gotten out of hand. We wanted to get along. We wanted race relations to approve, but if Custer was a foretaste of things to come, I warned there could be serious confrontations ahead. Pierre is in the northmost part of the state, and we were still there on February 19th or 20. We decided to camp near Eagle Butt at Red Scafo where some relatives of Mad uh, Madonna Gilbert, one of our bravest women, lived. We were there to relax for a few days with no, uh, no thought that great events were about to unfold. Alex Charging Hawk was host to the 15 or 20 of us. We bought a lot of groceries, flour, rice, potatoes, pejuta sapa, or black medicine, a Lakota name for coffee. Somebody donated a cow and we had a big cookout. We just were taking it easy. We were unaware that at Pine Ridge, things had gone from bad to worse. Dickie Wilson managed to defeat his impeachment for corruption and voting fraud by more voting fraud. His vice president, Vern Long, 
uh, uh, Vern Long reside, uh, resigned and discussed. The goon shot out windows in his home and killed his horse. Wilson installed two 50 caliber machine guns on the roof of the tribal council building, which was promptly renamed Fort Wilson. The U.S. government's favorite Indian also had the building sandbag. Hallways contained uh, shotguns and rifles stacked against the walls, ready for use. Canisters of tear gas good and uh, stood in rows whenever, when, wherever there was room. During elections, Wilson gave Pine Ridge citizens wine, whiskey, and money to vote him in. Pine Ridge was swarming with FBI agents and U.S. Marshals in uh, blue jumpsuits, already the first APCs. Some carrying machine guns were arriving to protect the government's darling uh, against big, bad aim. Wilson abolished all constitutional rights. Fear was spreading all across the Reds. No uh, AIM member was allowed to set foot on Pine Reds, not even Russell Means, who was a member of the tribe and whose family lived on the Reds. About 3 a.m. <clears throat> on February 27th, I was awakened by a loud pounding on the door. I was asleep inside the house. Ron uh, Petty, who had been sleeping outside in the tent, came in to say that someone from Pine Ridge had arrived with a tape from Russ. We sat down immediately and listened to it. Russ's voice said, Dennis, we need you to come down here to Calico, Calico, uh, Calico, as fast as you can make it. We're having a big meeting there tomorrow, and we think it will be better, uh, will be a matter of great importance. We need you. Bring as many people as you can. Don't come through Pine Ridge. You might get stopped or even hurt. Calico, South Dakota was just a tiny settlement consisting of about a dozen houses, but it contained a wooden building that served as a community center and meeting hall. The town was some five miles west of Pine Ridge. <laughs> by, the, by then, it was four o'clock in the morning. We had made some coffee, Ron, uh, uh, made some coffee. Ron said, what's, what's, what now? I told him, well, wake up everybody and tell them where we are, uh, where we're going. Tell them we're leaving for Pine Ridge today. Ron woke everybody up. There were some people camped pretty far away from us, way down by the river. So we had to wait until the sun came up in order to account for everybody. Alex's wife, Vicky, fixed a great big breakfast for us. Then I told everyone, Gala people have invited AIM to help them. Thanks could become serious. I asked whether somebody knew a way back to, to, uh, to Calico that would allow us to avoid Pine Ridge. Somebody did. I said, let's round everybody up and get along, uh, get going. It took out, it took our eight cars, two and three or two or three hours to get on the road. Hours were typically were typical Indian cars. Three of them had flat tires and no spares, and it took them time to fix them. Finally, we hit the road. I was in the lead car with Ron driving. We arrived at Calico Hall Community Center at 3 p.m. There were about 250 people milling around outside because the building was so full of people that no more, no, uh, that no more could squeeze in. The debate, uh, debate took place in the basement of the Calico Church, where tribal leaders sat at the several long tables near the back of the room. I mingled with the people quietly shaking hands. Russ was there, as well as Carter, Carter Camp and Clyde Bellacourt. All of the people we needed were in Calico. As far as I remember, Russ and I were the only representatives of AIM in the church, listening to what was said and witnessing what was taking place. We felt that we were guests that the speeches and decisions should be made by the uh, traditional uh, Ogolala uh, Sioux alone. Chief Frank Fools Crow, Pine Ridge's oldest and most respected medicine man, was speaking in Lakota. Uh, Pedro Bissodet translated everything he said. Pedro was the founder of OSCOR. Ogallala 
Sioux Civil Rights Organization and one of the staunchest uh, uh, opponents of the Wilson regime. Fools Crow said that he had followed the ways of the pipe all of his life and and in peace, but there were, uh, but that there comes a time when one must fight for survival of the Ogallala nation for a spirit. This was the time for the tribes, young men to go ahead and take care of things. Fools Crow said that if that's what we had to do, then now was the time to do it. I needed no translation to feel the passion, the desperation in his words, which gripped the hearts of all who were in the church. Pedro Bizonet uh, spoke after Fool's Crow. <laughs> so did Severick Young Bear and Chief Tom Bad Cop. Many stood up to speak and it seemed that they that by doing so, they freed themselves of a great burden that had weighed heavily on them. However, it was the women. Uh, Elaine Moves Camp, Gladys Bizon Bizonet, Lou Bean, and Hilger Ketches, who dominated the discussion. They were losing patience and wanted to take action. They shamed us men by their power and daring for making decisions. Ellen, uh, uh, Elaine Move Camp, uh, Moves Camp made a great impression up, uh, upon me. I had seen her earlier at the Yellow Thunder demonstration, uh, demonstrations in Gordon and at Custer. But listening to her impassioned words at Coleco was when I first felt close to her. She pointed a finger at me saying, Dennis Banks, what are you going to do? She didn't expect me to respond. It was a radical question. All the same, her words stung me. I felt as though I had been stabbed with the knife. Ellen continued, ever since we came here, we had been surrounded by marshals, goons, and spies. They had been watching us every minute. They're reporting every step we make. They could come in here right now to arrest us for exercising our constitutional rights. Dickie Wilson has forbidden any meetings, speech making, or traditional dancing on the reservation. But this is our land, Lakota land. It belongs to us, not to him and his goons. The goons are only minutes away, armed to the teeth, trying to frighten us. They come in here staggering, drunk, saying filthy words to us, shaking their fists in our face. Dennis Banks, what are you going to do about it? Gladys Bizonette, Pedro's aunt, also pointed her finger at me, making an even stronger appeal. You ain't people, what are you gonna do? You are supposed to be warriors, what are you gonna do? If you men can't do it, then we women will. Even as I speak, the FBI and marshals are taking over our schools, hospitals, and sacred places. Then she said the same thing in Lakota with such feeling and anger that many in the room began to weep. Finally, she added, we must take action today, not tomorrow. One of the men said that most of the people present wanted to storm the tribal council building and retake what was rightfully theirs. But he, but he said, that would be playing Wilson's game. That's what the goons expect us to do. They are just waiting for us with their machine guns, waiting to mow us down. <laughs> Lou Bean said, then let's go, let's not go to Pine Ridge. We're full of them. Instead, let's go to Wounded Knee and make our stand there. Her words shot through the crowd like electric shock. I felt chills running down my spine. Gladys Bizonet spoke to the, uh, the men again saying, let's go to Wounded Knee right now. The women were showing us the way. Leonard Crow Dog stood up and said that Wounded Knee was the most sacred place for the Lakota and the best place to make a stand. Severed Young Bear stood up then and said that it uh, that in going to Wounded Knee, we would bring a good spirit to the ghosts of our people who were massacred there in 1890. Russ and I stood up to give a last word. This was the only time we spoke during the meeting. I said that we would commit the American Indian movement body and soul to the struggle, however long it might last. And if necessary, we would die of this struggle. Fool's Crow ended the debate by saying, then we'll go to Wounded Knee. The AIM warriors will lead us. My heart was racing. My adrenaline surged at the thought of what we were about to do. I knew the drum was calling us, and we were heeding the call. Carter Camp said, let's secure Wounded Knee now. 
we have some 300 word warriors ready to go. If we're going to do it, let's do it right now. I said, let's organize a caravan. We had 54 cars. I rode in the lead car with Chief Fools Crow. We had a leader in almost every car. <clears throat> this time, we did not avoid Pine Ridge. We made a show of defiance by driving through the cold night right past Wilson's headquarters with our lights blazing, car horns honking, honking and aim flags fluttering from our uh, car antennas. The goons and marshals came running with guns in hand, trembling at the thought of an impeding attack. We drove right past them. They stood there open mouths and uncomprehending. I saw people running back and forth from the roof of the tribal council building like ants out of an ant heap stirred with a stick. It must have been at about six o'clock in the morning. It was just barely beginning to get light. Our caravan seemed, uh, seemed miles long. There were cars and cars and more cars. The miracle was that with so many old clunkers, not a single vehicle broke down. It seemed as if the spirit of the people had inspired the spirits of our old uh, wrecks. <clears throat> After we had arrived at Wounded Knee <laughs> and secured the area, <clears throat> the first thing we did was hold a prayer meeting at the Long Ditch, the mass grave of our slaughtered people. Meanwhile, some of our men were going through lighter sleeves, treading posts, stripping in beer, taking firearms, ammunition, and food, <clears throat> all items we really needed. I looked for Pedro Bizonet and found him grinning, wearing a big war bonnet. Uh, somebody had hot ears before at the treading post. I told the people standing around the treading post not to take anything and not to make a mess of things because it would reflect badly on us. <clears throat> The uh, Gildersleeves had a long history of exploiting Indians. Since beginning their operation in the early 1900s, they had expanded the training post into a cafeteria, a pawn shop, and a curio, uh, curio shop as well. There were stories, many stories, <clears throat> of the Gildersleeves opening local Indian mail and endorsing and cashing the, and, and, and enclosed government checks. The Gildersleeves said it was to cover debts that were owed to them. So cleaning out the trading post was a little payback that some of our people felt was justified. I did not take the government long to re it didn't take the government long to react after we, we reached the knee. Within an hour, the little, little hamlet <clears throat> was surrounded by roughly 100 marshals in combat boots and flat uh, vests. A long FBI agent in an expensive looking business who stood in a no uh, surveying the scene. Two armed personnel carriers came down an incline, the driver's heads comically sticking out the side windows. Two helicopters hovered overhead. Later, we we, we were buzzed by low flying pa uh, planes. Wounded Knee is situated inside a small valley surrounded by the rolling uh, prairie of low, uh, of low hills covered with gamma and buffalo grass. Vegetation is sparse, though here and there stand clusters of evergreens. The site is dominated by the hill on which the Sacred Heart Church stood. 25 years later, only the foundation of the church remain. Downhill below the church flows the creek in which so many victims of the 1890 massacre perished. We set up a defense perimeter command and command posts around the small white Sacred Hearts Catholic Church on the hill next to the mass grave. The perimeter was a low way wall, wall, uh, low wall, maybe four feet high, made of sandbags and cedar blocks. A child could have jumped over it. We had a uh, huge, large, four direction flag from the church. We established a sort of no man's land, a strip about 500 yards between us and the uh, nearest feds. We called it the DMZ. <laughs> after the demilitarized the zone in Vietnam. <laughs> in the middle of the zone, we put up a TP for any negotiations that would take place between us and the government. We uh, took stock of the situation, including what was taken from the trading post. We had roughly 35 farms, mostly 22, uh, 22s, or no, 0.225s. Is that what it, 0.22, 
Yeah. No, 0.225 or 0.8. 0.2s, I think. 0.2s. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's an S. I know it's hard to oh, see because it's so small okay. whether it's a five or an S, but. Oh, okay. Okay. I, see so. I had to blow it up. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what type of gun is that? <laughs> okay, mostly 22s. Yeah, I think a lot of us maybe create DMZs. <laughs> and hunting rifles. One of our, our men, Bobby Onko, a Ki Kiowa from Oklahoma had an a, uh, AK-47 with, with a banana clip, a souvenir from Vietnam. I don't oh, think yeah. he had any ammo for it. <laughs> he used it <laughs> to impress the media and the marshals. Later during the siege, we set up a stove pipe, which caused a panic among the feds. Oh my God, these Indians have a rocket launcher. We certainly didn't have any uh, rockets and almost no ammunition. We what little we had usually did not fit the strange assortments of arms we carried, and we doubted that much of it could reach the feds 500 yards away. It was a puning force to face the mightiest government in the world with its huge arsenal of deadly weapons. We also had very little food. Most of the people thought we would occupy the need for more, no more than, than two or three days. Our leadership knew better. Everybody went to the church. It was small, but it was the biggest uh, building we had. The churches, Jesuit priests, Father Paul uh, Manhart was sitting in the basement frightened. I went down to see him because I did not want him to have the wrong idea of why we occupied the church. I said, Father Manhart, you can have anything you want upstairs, food, coffee, whatever. He said, please, for God's sake, don't hurt me. <laughs> I told him, Father, we're not going to hurt you. You can walk around and talk to whoever you want. You can find out why we're here. Nobody will hurt you. He did not want to believe me. He looked at us as if we were redskins from some old movie come here, uh, come there to scalp him. He kept repeating, please don't hurt me. A car full of goons raced up the hill, snapped off two shots at us, snapped off two shots, shots at us, then took off as fast as they could. It was not a big thing, but it was an indication of what was to come. We put the grandmothers and small children in the church basement to keep them out of harm's way. Upstairs, the church was crowded. In fact, it was packed. People kept coming in and we couldn't find space for them. Some eventually settled down in the trading post, which slowly was transformed into a boarding house. I told our Ogallala uh, people, if anybody wants to go home and get a chance, uh, a change of clothing or blanket, you should do that now because at any moment, the feds will set up roadblocks and you won't be able to return. We don't know what's coming down on us. During the first 24 hours of occupation, Wounded Knee was, beehive, was a beehive or frantic activity. It was up to Clyde and me to find people on the outside we could count on for support. We called AIM chapters, churches, and organizations that helped us in the past, telling people to come up and help us with food and supplies. The phones uh, were open and had not yet been interfered with, so we would call anybody we wanted throughout the world. The response to our call for help was immediate. Support for us began to come in from around the country. Demonstrations for women wound and need were held in many cities. Uh, people even walked to the village under the cover of night, bringing backpacks full of food and supplies. Everybody uh, present was trying to volunteer for a variety of tasks. Task. I had never seen so many people totally committed to a single cause. There were occasional uh, uh, shots fired throughout the night. Some of our young men shot out the street lights on the main drive so that we could move about in the darkness without becoming easy targets for our enemies. <clears throat> I began to wonder about the consequences of our actions there at the knee, hoping and praying that nobody would be shot or killed. It had always been my main concern over the many years I had been with AIM that somebody would get trigger happy and provoke a deadly incident. I did not want a brother or sister to suffer because of an error on my part or somebody else's or because of somebody's uncontrolled emotion. We cannot allow a single, uh, allow single individuals to develop, develop their own agenda. <clears throat> the entire leadership made it clear to everyone what should be done and what should not. 
there would be no firing except in self-defense, and even then, only if sanctioned by our uh, leaders. So we felt everything <clears throat> had to have some kind of approval from the leadership because our actions and the possible consequences were more serious than they were at the BIA takeover or the Custer action. Wounded Knee was an event that would bring the world's attention to our struggle. One of the things I had learned was that the possibility of negotiation must always be there. We had to be willing to negotiate with even our most stubborn opponents in the midst of a fight. Among us were people from many tribes, Navajo, Ojibwa, Sot, Fox, uh, Potomwatomi, Iroquois, Lumbi, Shinnik, Go Pueblo, uh, Kiwa, uh, Comanche, uh, Ponca, and several more, including tribes from the Northwest. About 65% of the people present were local Lakotas from Pine Ridge, Rosebud, Shanty River, Standing Rock Reservations. Even some non Indians had come to help us, Chicano brothers, young white, white men and women from the 60s counterculture and a white doctor with a few nurses. We welcomed them all. People came and went. During the first two days, some of, uh, some of uh, our elders, such as Pete Catches and Frank Fools Crow, left for home at, the, at, at night and came back in the morning. Although we had already put up our roadblocks, although we had already put up our roadblocks, the FBI had not yet established theirs. Even after the marshals and FBI agents had closed ranks among, around us, they were never able to sell us off completely. Supporters always trickled through from the beginning to the end. We were about to maintain <clears throat> two-way traffic in spite of everything the feds would do to prevent that. The feds had their tripwire flares, their snipers with night scopes, and their attack dogs. Oscar Bear Runner and Servert Young Bear were our specialists in getting through. They always seemed to know how to avoid the feds, patrols, and dogs. I think we Indians were just naturally better at this kind of work, uh, night work because we lived so close to the earth. We had gathered up 11 white people and were holding them in one of the buildings near the trading post. Father Manhart, the gill sleeves, and the couple with the unpronounceable Polish name who had been hired to run the trading post were among them. We put our guards around them <clears throat> not to prevent them from escaping, but to prevent them from being harassed by any impetus young guys. We let them go after, uh, go after the first two days. They were the strangest hostages you, ev you ever saw. They refused to leave, saying they were afraid of the goons and the trigger-happy marshals. They told us that they felt a lot safer with us. Once it became clear we, we were going to be at wounded knee for a while, we realized we had decided who was in charge of what. Leonard Crow Dog, Wallace Black Elk were, <clears throat> as usual, our spiritual leaders. Stan Holder, a uh, a Wichita from uh, Oklahoma, was appointed head of security. Lorele De Cora from Iowa took charge of our hospital. She later uh, married Ted Means, Russ's uh, brother. Russ became our spokesman because he had a charisma and a good mouth. Carter Kent was uh, was gather support and sometimes take charge of the Warriors. Matt King Jr. was our official interpreter. I became one of the principal spokespersons for Aang. Kamuk was with me at Wounded Knee. We slept that first night in a car. Around two or three o'clock in the morning, I kissed her and said, please, please don't get yourself hurt. What is happening here is a major, major event in the history of our people. It will affect their lives and our own lives. It is a privilege for us to be here at this time. I don't know how long we'll be here or how it will end. Out there, the feds have heavy weapons and enough ammunition to kill every Indian in South Dakota 10 times over. People might get wounded or killed. I pray with all my heart that this won't happen. I love you. Please, please don't get hurt. And then, uh, and, and though the cold night was full of threats, Kamuk and I were snug, warm, and full of hope for the future. That was beautiful. Yeah. 
And that's chapter 13, comrades. So uh, we know uh, how how important making a stand is. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, and that that's that's the significance of wounded knee on one level. You know what I mean? To me, is that uh, you know our indigenous brothers and sisters coming together and saying we ain't going for it no more. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, it's it's a it's an act of defiance that uh, is inspiring, and you see that people around the world and people around the country uh, uh, really was inspired to uh, be a part of that to help in some type of way. People he said was coming in day and night, you know what I mean, bringing them supplies and stuff like that, you know what I mean, and that shows that inner communal solidarity that we. Oh, yeah. uh, this this movement is about you know what I'm saying. Uh, we we don't have to be indigenous to understand they're oppressed. We don't have to be indigenous to understand that their land is being taken. We don't have to be indigenous mm -hmm. to understand that they've been colonized. That even reservations is colonies. You know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. uh, under the oppression of the United States uh, uh, dictatorship of this capitalist imperialist system. You know what I mean. And uh, I, I think this is uh, highlights. Uh, you know what it means uh, when people come together in solidarity how people before might have not thought that was ever possible you know it, it, it's ironic in every age people always say ah oh, people you you never get the community to come again together where they're too dysfunctional they do this and too that you know what i'm saying but it comes in uh times in history where uh, the moments that it brings people together and they realize it's now or never, you know what I mean? And I think that Wounded Knee was like a uh, uh, important chapter in the page of the American Indian movement, you know what I mean? And they're really becoming the American Indian movement in the full meaning of the word, uh, the name. Uh, I know, Gabby, uh, you had your hand up first. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I just want to... I just wanted to say, um, I just want to say that, you know, everything that they said was fine, you know, and, they, you know, I'll say, I um, mean, you know, you don't have to be um, indigenous or, um, or anyone to be a revolutionary, you know, anyone can be a revolutionary, anyone can contribute and have that solidarity with each other, regardless of who you are, regardless of what ethnic group you're from, anyone can, you know, um, anyone can, um, anyone can um, pitch in and help um, and help in solidarity in whichever way they can. And, you know, when people think of, you know, revolution, you know, they often think of it as just, you know, guns and stuff, but like, no, you know, as, um, as a wise person said, um, um, revolution is all about problem solving, you know, it's not just about, um, it's not just about being um, militant in the streets, which is, which is also an important aspect of revolution, but it's about providing for your community, you know, it's about, it, it, it's about making sure that they have healthy, um, it, it, it's to make sure that they have drinkable water and healthy food and housing and things to take care of. It's about providing self-sufficiency for your community to eventually build up to that militancy, because once they see that this works once they see that there is a possibility for better they will they will engage in revolution that's why everyone helped aim if aim was just if aim was just some random group that you know um that never did anything and never engaged with their community no one would help them no one would engage with them but the reason why so many people helped them was because they showed how this is possible they cemented their, themselves within the indigenous communities and show them how how a better possibility was better and when and when and when they did that um everyone um everyone pitched in and everyone engaged um in the political and ideological line of aim and uh yeah you're muted comrade i can't hear you <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, right off. <laughs> Absolutely. That that was uh well uh well said, you know what I mean? Uh at the end of the day, you definitely right. Uh Zen. Um I just want to point out like okay, at the beginning of the chapter when they were describing how this shit started popping off when they were still like on the res and whatnot, and this fucking Wilson asshole is doing stuff like mounting machine guns to that building. That is their building. 
not the fucking governments. That is on yep. the reservation. Yep. That belongs to the people of the tribe. And I'm sitting here like, fucking seize that shit. <laughs> <laughs> seize the media <laughs> production. But to think about that. I'm like, they end up holding their fucking line with nothing but a bunch of fucking pea shooter 22s, the you know, and some some shotguns and whatnot that ain't even loaded. <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> it's amazing, though, that like even just that visual right there was enough to make the motherfuckers who have the machine guns hold right. back. Like, ooh, what, what are we getting ourselves into and shit? You know, but and that would have right. been dope if they'd been able to fucking seize that building and take it from them with the machine guns mounts on it and shit. Like, really? Hey, you, hey you know what I was thinking? Because I've been, uh, if y'all ever get a chance, watch uh it's uh you can go to YouTube, it's on there free. Uh mm -hmm. put in their history channel, uh Art of War, Sun Zoo, and watch that. Uh that's 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 like one of the best documentaries breaking down the art of war and Sun Tzu. I was thinking if they wanted to take that building, they should have uh they could have went to Wounded Knee. But that was a diversion because I remember uh, uh, at one point uh, Sun Tzu, when he's fighting uh, uh, Shu, the kingdom of Shu, he diverts and acts like he's about to attack the capital. But mm -hmm. instead of attacking the capital, it was really a ploy to bring them into a trap where one force was going to come from the right and another uh, force that uh, that they were chasing was going to turn around and confront them. And that's uh, how... Uh, uh, one of the battles, uh, this decisive battles that uh, he, uh, he fought. But I was thinking like, yeah, that could have been a diversion to act like we're going to Wounded Knee, but have a reserve of uh, aim and uh, different comrades say, okay, as soon as they abandon this building, then we're going to take uh, uh, that building that they just abandoned. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Without the machine guns. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, I can't wait till something. we study the art of war and read some of these strategy books and stuff uh coming next year that's gonna be big too yeah. you know what i mean indeed uh, um let sorry. me uh let me get to uh demar demarley uh and then i get back to you gabby mm -hmm. yeah have you ever noticed that when someone is doing something right or someone is doing something out <coughs> of the spirit of having a good heart they're automatically termed revolutionary mm -hmm. so whenever you're uh -huh. setting do good you're a revolutionary you're you know against the status quo right um, right the second thing is you should really read um art of war for women by sun tzu <coughs> I actually wrote one for women oh uh, i think i heard that and who who's that by sun tzu he wrote both of them he wrote the regular art of war and then he wrote art of war for women Wow, I've never That's cool. I heard Art of I didn't I didn't know if, uh he wrote it though. I definitely gotta check that out. Art of War uh War for Women. Absolutely. I appreciate you turning that because I I I I'm I heard that but I, I didn't know it was Sun Zoo. So yeah, I'm gonna That's definitely cool. look into that. Yeah, yeah. That's Did cool. you have I something to say? Uh oh uh I'm gonna respond to what you said though. Uh yeah, and it's crazy. It's ironic. Revolution has always been a good word, war, uh, word when it was uh, used by the uh, the current uh, status quo. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. when we talk about the American Revolutionary War, you know, that's something that they uphold in these schools and yep. <laughs> to this day. You know what I mean? Yep. George Washington, you know what I mean? Uh, talking about, uh, you know, how uh, what Paul Revere, you know what I'm saying? Uh, they even throw different uh, uh, people at us to make us identify. Like, I used to never identify with Crispus uh, addicts and stuff when they talk about him in school. I was like, what? That was a black dude? Like, why? What the fuck? Wasn't we most of us slaves? Like, what did he accomplish for us? You know what I mean? So, you know, revolution is always a positive word until mm -hmm. the status quo is uh, like, I'm, I'm pretty sure the King uh, uh, England at that time when they was uh, talking about revolution here in the United States, you didn't want to say around that time, they didn't see that as a positive, you didn't want to say mm -hmm. but 
that's that's the march of history. You know what I'm saying? Uh, revolution mm -hmm. is the transformation of the status quo, as you would say. But it's really uh even more so. It's a it's a, a revolution of the social economic uh, uh system. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? It's overthrowing one system uh for another system in a fundamental exactly. sense. You know what I'm saying? Really, the Civil War could have been called uh uh, uh a revolution in, in some sense. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Because it was overthrowing uh, one system for another system, you know, overthrowing slavery, chattel slavery for capitalism. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. uh, Adam Smith, if you never, uh, if, if y'all never read Adam Smith, read uh, Adam Smith as a uh, historical materialist. I look at Adam Smith as a revolutionary of his time. Exactly. You know he ain't no revolutionary of our time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, definitely not. Yeah, but his his uh class at that time, which was the bourgeoisie, was oppressed by the feudal uh feudal exactly. lords and the feudal system, and that revolution that followed all those different revolutionaries, the French Revolution, all that stuff was uh overthrowing a system that was actually uh 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 what would I say? It was uh uh feudalism of capitalism. Say it again. Oh, I said, um, because if I remember correctly, the French Revolution, um, um, the, the French Re Revolution at first, like, if I remember correctly, it started off as like, you know, um, a revolution by the people, but then it was picked up by the bourgeois. Um, which well, yeah, developed. yeah. All right, right. Yeah. Out outmoded. It was an outmoded uh, means of production and distribution, yep. you know, feudalism. So that's what it made the, those revolutions revolutions. That's exactly. why we should look at ourselves in the same light. We're revolutionaries in, in the sense of our time where this capitalist system is outmoded. You know what I'm saying? It is no longer <laughs> serving the interests of the people whatsoever. You know what I'm saying? It's oppressive, it's alienating. You know what I'm saying? It's actually a, a uh, impeding the development of the means of production. You know what I'm saying? They destroyed mm -hmm. the means of the production all the time during these depressions, recessions, and stuff like that, which could go to actually helping us uh, uh, produce more uh, goods to satisfy the needs of the people. You know what I'm saying? Indeed. So this is something, this is why this makes this our revolution uh, uh, forward-looking, whereas when we look back at their revolution, that's a time that's outmoded now. So their time is long gone. Uh, I want to I want to get to Joe uh, Gonzalez because I know he's out there with uh, you know the uh, Brown Berets. You know, what mm -hmm. I mean, we we gave a shout out to y'all a little earlier, uh, comrade. We know y'all beating for y'all uh, national conference that y'all having out there in Sacramento. Uh, I would I would like you before you read the summary of this chapter. I would like you to uh, talk to us a little bit about what's going on out there in Sacramento, uh, what y'all plan on uh, some of the activities and some of the stuff that's going to be taking place tomorrow. Uh, yeah, uh, unfortunately, I don't have the summary because, well, because of, of time crunch. Besides, I was ironing my uniform, getting ready for tomorrow. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> but but no, and, and shining my boots. But uh, no doubt. It, a lot of things are going to be brought on to play in, in tomorrow's conference, uh, La Mesa Nacional Conference. Um, and it's going to be different key points highlighted because we have so many things across the board that are facing us as revolutionary comrades um, within our communities. And so a couple of things we're going to highlight is the immigration. I'm sure we're going to touch on, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to touch on uh, Leonard Peltier and uh, political prisoners, um, and I know there's going to be other speeches um, that I don't I don't know all the speeches and stuff like that. So that's yet to unfold till tomorrow. But what's what's nice is the collection of Brown Berets and other uh, organizations going to be in attendance tomorrow, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, making a a good boots on the ground uh, effect on on spreading knowledge and spreading uh Oh, and I know also Partido de la Raza, neither party will be there in attendance. Okay. Uh, we have, we're working on the Elders uh, Council, uh, Brown Beret Elders Council. Um, that's going to be brought up tomorrow. And okay. Sean nice. will be in attendance also. And excuse me, I'm outside because uh, they're, ah, they're not here. But um, 
Well, what, what, what's going to be nice is we're going to show a string. And uh, th that's positive, especially when we're talking about a lot of the topics that are going on today. Um, and like, excuse me, I don't have the summary, to, you know, but, but a lot of the topics that are going on today are still the same that were faced back then. And it's still a struggle. And uh, we got to all stay strong, comrades, all throughout. Well, wherever, whatever the neck of the woods we're in, we and it, we got to stay solid. We got to stay in contact. We got to keep on motivating one another through these book uh, readings and and the different books that are coming up. I'm looking forward to the Young Lords. Um, Absolutely. And uh, so, I mean, just keep on acquiring that little knowledge. It's going to keep us strength. And, and I like, I'm going to be mentioning the Rainbow Coalition tomorrow too. So don't y'all worry. Nah, you already know. All prior to the people. Oh, uh, power, one power. thing, uh, yeah. uh, while you out there, I, I know you, you've you been wanting to get uh, even more Brown Berets involved. Uh, while you talk about the Second Rainbow Coalition, talk about our book reading program and how how a lot more of uh, Brown Berets, especially when we do Johnny Torres' book uh, uh, and read his book. I think that'd be cool mm -hmm. that a lot of Brown Berets come on here show support for Johnny Torres. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, unfortunately, we got the call today. He's not going to be able to make it. You know, like a lot of us were like, oh, but right, uh, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're still all together in solidarity, no matter where we're at. Um, yeah, no, most definitely we're going to bring it up. And I'll bring it up to Rafa also that we uh, make sure to bring that into light when we're talking about uh, working in union with our comrade brothers and sisters. Um, it, it's, it, that's, going, that's where the strength is going to be. And uh, yeah. We're going. I'm. I'm definitely going to put it out there. So don't worry. I'll be. I, no, no. I've been sharing it. I've been sharing hey. it with people. Uh, I, I just know that, like, um, you know, we had talked about this before. Like, oh, it's only for people for the book uh, reading. They have to be pre-approved and stuff like that. And only certain people are invited. So it kind of like puts my limit on to actually putting it out there to to a lot of the organizations I work with because they're for some reason. Uh, well, they're, they're not on that book uh, reading club thing or with the Rainbow Coalition, the new Rainbow Coalition. Um, so mm -hmm. that's something we can work on in the future and stuff like that. And, but I'm definitely going to bring it up to the Brown Berets because they, they include it already automatically. And uh, I'll, I'll share it with the comrades. Absolutely. Appreciate you, comrade. Uh, thanks for coming on. Uh, I know, I know uh, like y'all out there, uh, doing a lot of a uh, lot of stuff going on for you to come on here. Uh, that just shows you how much uh, you really, really yeah. see the importance and the respect. Dedication, you know, you know that's um, dedication. Yeah, dedication that's and stuff to that. You know, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. Boots on the ground out of Sacramento, still with the book club. <laughs> All power. Yes. All power. Yeah. We we definitely. I gotta get in there and take a shower because we gotta. We got a pre-event uh, going on tonight, so we can all touch bases and get planned out for tomorrow. Uh, some of us got to get ready to start setting up some chairs and stuff for our Pachuco dance ball after the event tomorrow. Uh, so that's 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 always going to be nice. That's what's up. Well, I'm glad you uh, came on here, uh, shared a little of uh, what's going on out there, and your uh, and mm -hmm. and just uh, mm -hmm. your support, your your constant support and dedication to what we built it here, you know, that's important. And uh, we appreciate that, comrade. Yeah, I can just see us growing stronger. So uh, with that said, I'll put myself on mute because I'm up in traffic. Uh, and then I'll, I'll listen to y'all's final thoughts or closing thoughts. And sorry, I didn't have the summary. She sent it to me, but we were working on other stuff for Leonard Peltier. We were working on like all kinds of other things. And I was like, well, I got, I got discombobulated. So I, I can't share it this evening. But hey, oh, okay. next, I hope to see y'all on Sunday too, because I'll still be out here on Sunday. Um, right. But I think I'll have more time for sure. Okay, appreciate okay. you. All right, all power to the people, comrades. All power, all power to the people. Uh, go ahead, uh, Gabby. Uh, did you have something else you wanted to add? Um, yeah, um, I have a lot to add now because of just how y'all were making good, good fucking points. Um, um, first off, um, comrade, uh, comrade Kwame, specifically when it comes to you reading books about, you know, re revolutionary tactics, um, I, I need to read th those books that you mentioned as well. And 
I'm also planning on reading um I'm also planning on um on reading um Che's um um Che's books on guerrilla guerrilla warfare. That's another book yeah. that I want to read as well. Yeah. That I think that thing is also um uh, very important. Um and to what and um and more more um to emphasize more I want to to specific to, to specifically add on what you said about revolution because yes you're one hundred percent correct you know all of human history encompasses um all of human history is class struggle every single every single historical event has always been related to um to class struggle and revolution you know because revolution inherently when you when when, when you take when, when you tear it down and you go and you look at its core a revolution and a revolutionary is something that moves class struggle forward that is what revolution is right. how the bourgeois right. moved class struggle forward because 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 capitalism moved us from feudalism to capitalism and right. and during their time the feudalists were revolutionary because they moved us from slave economy to feudalism you know revolution is always about moving class struggle forward it's always about going forward it's all it's always about as you said um, replacing one socioeconomic system with another socioeconomic system, each one with it with its own relation of production, mode of right. production, um, and so on and so forth. You know, each one with its own contradictions, and this goes for all socioeconomic systems. You know, right. And when it comes to socialism, not only the socialism has to, uh, not only the socialism have things that contradict with capitalism, but it also has things that contradict with, with communism with communism as well. As socialism um, still has a state, it still has, um, it still has currency, and it still has, um, um, it still has classes. You know, each socioeconomic right. system contradicts each other in some way. And when it comes to the, um, when it comes to, um, when it comes to the U.S. Revolution in general, the U.S. Revolution at its core was a bourgeois re revolution. That's right, what it right. was. The the um the, the sellers of the U.S. had a, had had a little had a little revolution with with Britain because they wanted to be the sole benefactors of imperialism and white supremacy in the U.S. They didn't want to, they, they didn't want to split the share right. with um with um with um with the crown um in Britain. They wanted to have all that wealth for themselves. You know, same thing with um same thing with the um with the Civil War. The Civil War was literally a bourgeois conflict between um between between the Union. And um, between the Union and the Confederacy, which was a proto-fascist movement, um, so yeah, a revolution has always been about moving class struggle forward. Um, human history is comprised of revolution of different socioeconomic systems and superstructures replacing another, and we are revolutionaries as um, and we are revolutionaries the same way how the bourgeois were, were revolutionary in their time, and the same way how the feudalists were revolutionary in their time. You know. Um, right. Adam Smith was basically the Marx of his time when he was right. alive, basically. So, yeah, revolution is all about moving class, uh, about moving class struggle forward. And um, I've said before, and, I, and I'll say it again, half of what it means to be revolutionary and to be a communist is to be a decent human being, you know? So if you're a decent human being, you're halfway to being a communist. And, uh, yeah. Right, I appreciate that, Conrad. Right. That was a good historical materialist uh, analysis of mm -hmm. uh, uh, the bourgeois revolution, feudal uh, revolutions, and stuff that like that. Because it did, uh, you know, from slavery to feudalism, uh, people got a lot more freedom. You did want to say from feudalism to capitalism, a lot of people got more freedoms uh, under the mm -hmm. uh, system. Now, socialism is going to bring a lot more freedom to the people. Exactly. You know? And it's going to actually bring real democracy for the first time. Exactly. Uh, class society to the people. You know what I'm saying? Uh, mm -hmm. One thing I want to add too is uh, the Civil War, and this shows you uh, uh, we we can't have a mechanic a mechanical materialist analysis of history. Exactly. Uh, because it uh, when you we look at the Civil War, that was a coalition of two different classes. Uh, the mm -hmm. slave class and the bourgeois class. Mm -hmm. uh, at some point, uh, no matter all these MAGA, Trump supporter, Confederate, Nazi type of people, they don't realize that was a class of uh, clash of classes. You didn't want to say ruling classes at the time. And, uh, you know, the capitalists was almost, 
I, I'm not going to say inevitable because there ain't nothing, no such thing as inevitable when you look at it from a historical materialist analysis. Because if Robert mm -hmm. would have been a better <clears throat> general and, and did make different decisions, who knows? They could have defeated the Union Army at Gettysburg and all kind of stuff. You know what I mean? Uh, it, mm -hmm. it's, it's about that in that uh, uh, documentary uh, about uh, uh, Sun Tzu. Uh, where they bring up Gettysburg and stuff, but because because those were a clash of two different class uh, dictatorships, it was going to mm -hmm. come in. There was going to be a civil war. You know what I'm exactly. saying? Exactly. The slave owning class was going to win on out that owning class dictatorship of the slave owners or the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. You know what I'm saying? Yep. And it just came to head. Uh, 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 yeah, please post the doc. Okay, I got you, uh, Rob. Um, it, it came to hit. You know what I'm saying? Where one mm -hmm. and out, and the bourgeoisie understood. Even Adam Smith, in his book, The Wealth of the Nation, said this. He said that slavery is an inferior system to capitalism. Mm -hmm. Capitalism or superior social economic system that can produce a lot more wealth than slavery. Mm -hmm. Think about under slavery, uh, the starting point was how many slaves you had. The mm -hmm. starting uh, under capitalism is what is the level of development of your means of production. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So this what made uh, uh, the capitalism a more superior system because they saw it from a more scientific uh, analysis that if you increase the level of uh, means of production, you can produce more with less people. Mm -hmm. But the opposite side of that is when you produce more with less people and you uh, continually produce over your market, you're going to have recessions and depressions. Constantly. Exactly. Yep. These are contradictions of how uh, capitalism plays out. And, th and this is why it's, it impedes the development of the means of production where uh, on one hand, you got private appropriation, a small group of people that uh, profit off of the production why production is socially produced. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. That's contradictory. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, privately appropriated by that small class of people that own that means of production. But the way that we solve that contradiction is what is socially produced is a socially, also socially appropriated, meaning the people mm -hmm. uh, off of what their own labor or what they produce that's in the interest of people. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I see the Marley says some. Uh, what better way to give folks determined to fight than to call it religious freedom? Yeah, yeah, they, they use all kind of different uh, ways to yeah the class struggle. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but the rally cries, right? Yeah, but that's yeah. that. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, I was gonna add a yeah, and to add another point, it, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Comrade Kwame. But the um the Confederacy, if I remember correctly, was primarily comprised of petty bourgeois, correct? They were they're primarily comprised of, if I remember correctly, um petty bourgeois that um that were facing extinction from the national imperial bourgeois due to uh, monopolization, if I remember correctly. I, I don't know that part of the breakdown of uh of the Confederacy. Uh I just know the one that really led it was uh, uh, at the end of the day fighting for uh, the dictatorship of the slave owning class. But I don't mm -hmm. know like opposition of uh, so much of uh, what made up the bulk of of uh, the leadership of 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 that uh, side of the struggle. Uh, Robert mm -hmm. Strong, I know uh, you got your hand up. I know. Uh, uh, hey man, family. Man. I want to say that was a part of the Civil War or something like that, right? Um, yeah, one of my ancestors uh, fought uh, under um, he he fought for uh, a Kentucky abolitionist squad called the Red String Raiders, and eventually he got mustered into the Army of the Cumberland alongside General August Willich. And I would like to promote this book uh, by David Dixon, Radical Warrior, and it, oh. it he goes in and. August Willich was a card-carrying communist. Not many people realize That's an American cool. U.S. general was a 
communist who was part of the London Youth Communist League. He was, he was like third in command to Marx and Engels, basically. And he actually wanted to turn the Civil War into a full-on class war and rewrite the Constitution. And, oh, go ahead. He, he um, I mean, uh, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the uh, raising of, of troops before the war um, was, was done at the Cincinnati Workers' Hall. That was kind of his base of operations. And that later became one of the centers of the Working Men's Party. Um, and the Working Men's Party kind of formed some of the foundation of the first international. Um, and, and he wanted to actually have, like, uh, he wanted to keep going. He wanted to keep fighting the industrial North <laughs> and some of the, um, the subsequent labor revolts in the 1870s and 80s you know, uh, with the miner strikes and the railroad strikes were kind of a continuation of some of that socialist movement that was really heavy in Ohio and Indiana, actually, of, of all places. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's uh, really very, interesting. Yeah, that's an interesting part of history that I didn't know it, uh, about until uh, Rob uh, told me about that when we was out there in California on that book tour. And, uh, that's definitely something uh to look into to see how uh that war could have been trans uh transformed into a proletariat uh war. You dig what I'm saying? Indeed. Uh, so that's that's an interesting fact of history. Indeed. Uh, um I I was gonna add that uh when revolution eventually does um take place in um when it, when revolution does eventually take place um in the US. I personally believe it's going to be fought um, in three fronts, that being between the fascists, um, the bourgeois, and uh, um, the united front. I personally think um, it's going to be fought on three fronts. It's basically going to be like the original American Civil War, but, um, but instead communists are going to be involved in it, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 I, I, I can see that. I, and one other thing, I surmise uh, by reading history, uh, mm -hmm. And seeing how this nation is developed, I, I think, uh, and this is why I always look at, try to look at stuff from a dialectical materialist analysis and understanding what's the composition of the United Front going to look like. Uh, mm -hmm. Like, for instance, when Kay, uh, Shane Kai-shek fought alongside with, uh, with Mao uh, to buy, uh, drive out the Japanese and stuff, that was a part of the United Front to, uh, you know, uh, that was necessary that Mao, even though he wasn't always committed to it, <laughs> you know what I mean? He still fought the communists at different times, you know what I mean? But I, I see, <coughs> I see uh, we're going to have a similar composition with a lot of nationalists. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Brown nationalists, nationalists, black nationalists, uh, indigenous nationalists that might not necessarily agree with us, you know what I'm saying? Ones that come from mm -hmm. that revolutionary intercommunalist uh, analysis of, of uniting the people to free ourselves from capitalism. Uh, but it's mm -hmm. going to be a temporary, uh, temporary uh, uh, contradiction. United, yeah, united front that's going to help us uh, defeat the capitalists and the uh, and uh, and the more overt fascists uh, that's yep. going to be uh, fighting amongst themselves. But after that. I think, uh, in my opinion, uh, it's going to be probably a lot of nationalists that uh, once we win that victory, it's probably going to turn against us and want to maintain capitalism under black nationalism, under brown mm -hmm. nationalism. You know what I'm saying? So it might be another yeah. front that we eventually have to fight. So knowing this, this is the reason why political education at this time uh, we're on the political phase of this uh, revolutionary struggle. This is why mm -hmm. we have to win over as many of these nationalists as we can so they understand and uh, have a correct political line. Because a lot of them exactly. just have don't have a correct class analysis at all. They don't even have a class analysis. Exactly. You know what I'm <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, the more we can do that at this time in, uh, in the struggle, uh, by the time we do have that type of conflict that emerged, we'll have a lot more of them that uh, came over to the correct political line and uh, we'll have less uh, to have to deal with them. Uh, one other thing I would like to keep in mind, when we do come to power, it's still going to be a lot of people that have uh, different uh, world outlooks that mm -hmm. was 
a part of the revolution. When you look at China, when you look at Russia, you know, you had a lot of those national, uh, a lot of those people in the Chinese Communist Party, uh, the Bolshevik, they weren't all communists. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That's partly why those revolutions was uh, reversed because the communists was really outnum outnumbered by these nationalists, these cultural nationalists that was a mm -hmm. part of these revolutions. So again, we're going to have to keep on having that two line struggles uh, going on, even with people that join our movement. They might not fully have a fully scientific socialist analysis of things, but we're going to have to mm -hmm. have those struggles with them to win them over because the more we win them over now, we have less to uh, antagonisms that's going to uh, uh, try to undermine us going forward <laughs> and rebuilding exactly. socialism and pushing the socialist movement forward. You know what I mean? It reminds me of, uh, actually, um, what you just said, it reminds me of um, yeah. how during the Chinese Civil War, it reminds me how how um, how during the Chinese Civil War, um, if, if memory serves <clears throat> correctly, the petty bourgeois actually sided with um, the PRC um, because um, because they were against the national bourgeois, but after um, but after after um, the Chinese Revolution was over, the petty bourgeois were eventually pro um, proletarianized um, by the PRC um, and and brought into their side. Right, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, does anyone have anything else to add to it? Uh, if not. Uh... You know, this uh, I always try to keep it about an hour and a half of these uh, book readings and uh, discussions and stuff. So I know a lot of people got other stuff going on and everything. Uh, but uh, I enjoyed uh, everyone's uh, uh, input, uh, insight, uh, even even how this branched off and start talking about what revolution is. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. and, I love You that. know, I thought that was very uh insightful uh hopefully a lot of people that's gonna watch this on youtube uh have a different view of revolution because people talk use the word revolution so casually but don't really understand uh what revolution is you know what i'm saying that's why I always, yeah that's why i even emphasize as a communist that even adam smith was a revolutionary in his time you know what i'm mm -hmm. saying and when we we understand that, then we understand like what revolutionary fundamentally is. It's actually uh, uh, overthrowing outmoded systems. It's uh, talking about the class struggles. It's talking about a uh, social economic system being replaced by another social economic system. That's fundamentally what revolution is. This is why mm -hmm. we are revolutionaries. This is what makes us revolutionaries. We see this social economic system, uh, capitalism is being, is impeding all human development, all human progress, all human uh, 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 development that's going to be an interest for the people. You know what I'm saying? That's what makes us fundamentally a revolutionary right there. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So. Can I just say one quick thing? Yeah. Um, I just want to add, and you know, um, another thing that's very important is when we, when humanity does eventually reach communism, a very important thing to add is that even under, right, even under, um, even under communism, it's not like, it's not like society is just going to stop, you know, it's not like things are, are just going to stop and, and, you know, and, and you know, it's going to become society forever. Like, no, there will, there will always be something afterwards, you know? The materialistic conditions don't just don't just stay static. They they're, they're, it's always changing. It's always there's always evolving. There will always be struggle in some way, regardless um, um regardless of what socioeconomic system is taking place. There will always be something next. So even when so even when um the socialist trans transitionary phase um has reached um its end, and once communism has been achieved there will always be something afterwards because class struggle never ends, you know? And yeah. Well, I would, I would, I would say this, not necessarily class struggle will never yeah, not, end, yeah. but antagonisms and contradictions will never end. Yeah. yeah Cause yeah. once we achieve uh, communism, class struggle uh, ceases to uh, be. Uh, yeah, but exactly. yeah, yeah. but as Marx and Engels and uh, Lenin and Mao all ex uh, explain, 
that contradiction is still going. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to struggle. We're going to have two line struggles then. It might not be uh, encompass a, a, a class uh, analysis or a class position, but it's going to be a, a two line struggle against incorrect and correct positions on how to move society going forward. You know exactly. what I'm saying? So, oh, yeah. uh, most Thanks definitely. for that correction, Comrade Kwame. Thanks for that correction. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> one thing I want to add to that, too, is um, something that I've learned from studying Marxist theory and grasping, you know, the alignments there, because I used to be a straight up anarchist. I am now a anarcho-communist, because I understand <laughs> from also reading things like Lenin's State and Revolution, why that state is actually needed to protect the results of the revolution from capitalist forces coming back in. Um, but part of that is during the years of communism, when you have everything organized from the bottom up and you actually are putting into place um, the accountability that needs to be had and people learning by participating how to self-govern, the through that, you are actually able to reach anarchism. Anarchism is nothing but the highest level of communism itself, because that is at that point where you actually can become stateless, because as a society, you have learned how to fucking govern yourselves mm -hmm. and not have so much of those contradictions, at least in that facet of it, where you're able to self-govern, you are able to actually regulate your own fucking actions from having learned some ethics and accountability along the way <laughs> as the the entire framework of how, how people's perspective changes throughout mm -hmm. the years of communism, of understanding that in order to actually thrive and not just survive, we do this together. Mm -hmm. And that means you got to let go of the bullshit that leads to most things that fall under, you know, quote unquote, criminal activity and whatnot. Of Once you actually have that footing of grasping my rights end where yours begin, then you can see that fundamental change in society. And that actually is the long term goal is is to reach anarchism as the highest state of communism. Yeah, and uh, one, one of the biggest difference between the communists and anarchists is they just don't realize that transition. Socialism, you got to have the state just to eventually abolish the state. You know, the state, mm -hmm. uh, like like Mark says, withers away. And that's exactly. because we've, we've overcome capitalism, imperialism everywhere. No capitalist imperialist is going to allow us to exist. You know exactly. what I'm saying? They're no going to always try to undermine us. That's one way. That's that's externally. But internally, it's going to be different worldviews, ideological, political uh, views, uh, class positions. You know what I'm saying? That, mm -hmm. that will return us back to capitalism if we don't have a state that keeps us on that uh, socialist road to communism. You know exactly. what I'm saying? So that's that. Uh, I salute you, uh, Zen, because... Uh, when I'm uh, anarchists, they frustrate the hell out of me. I'm like, <laughs> well, how are you going to protect this? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and exactly. That's what I'm asking. History, yeah, where in history has an uh, uh, anarchist communal society exist that still wasn't oppressed by some bourgeois capitalist state? Exactly. You know what never. I'm saying? It has never happened. Or even never. having troublesome infighting amongst their own because people ain't fucking learned how to self-govern yet. And yeah. it's like, they want to talk about it in this... <laughs> This fucking romanticized, idealistic manner right. of like, oh, well, we can all handle our own shit. Really? How many motherfuckers you know can handle their own shit when it comes like to self-regulation and self-governance? Because until we actually learned, fix the rest of the shit show and change the way people think and their right. the way that they operate. Right. They're still gonna fucking not see those ethical boundaries of how to treat each other and gonna be crossing those lines. And I mean, that's just on a, a basic level of interpersonal interactions. That's before we even get to as a society. And, right. you know, if we really want to be able to do things like 
get rid of the fucking prison system. Mm-hmm. We have to have better built systems of accountability <clears throat> in our direct communities mm-hmm. that actually handle problems when they come up. Right. And be able to do things like criticism and self criticism. Right. And hold each other accountable. And when <clears throat> there is opportunity to do so, to make up for any, you know, issues the right. one they have caused and it takes a long time to really change the frame of mind of people on a societal level it's going to take some time for people to stop clinging to past ideals of wanting to bring back capitalism so that they can just fucking exploit and yeah, that's exactly one facet of it right this is Absolutely. a whole like societal change right Not that's what we need cultural revolution past. Yeah. 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 That's 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 exactly what it's gonna it's gonna take. That's and it's gonna reflect uh, the superstructure is gonna reflect that new social economic base. You know what I'm saying? So exactly when we talk about ideals, values, morality, culture, uh, all of that is gonna reflect a different way of human beings relating to each other as full human beings uh, relating to each other and uh, associating as human beings. I ain't going to be no borders no more. There's not going to be uh, uh, distinctions uh, like how white supremacy made us all as if we're not the same species. You know what exactly. I mean? It's a lot of different uh, outmoded ideals that has to die within the human species to get to there. And so that's going to exactly. be a cultural... That's going to be a cultural revolution uh, that that takes place during socialism to even move us towards that direction where we are. Uh, and for me, I feel like that's when we really enter human history. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? As a species. You know what I mean? Yep. Like right as now. A species. To, oh, sorry. Uh, go ahead. Oh, no. I was just going to say as a species, not only can we do better, but we need to do better. You know, like we are, right. we are capable of so much. So that much. like it's it's saddening how we are limited on such you know <laughs> petty right. um, petty individualistic thoughts. We're like we are capable of so many beautiful things, but right. we're just limited by having an individualistic bourgeois thought, which is why cultural revolution is so important. You know, to um to uproot those thoughts and to relearn through having a dialectical and critical analysis of ourselves of the world around us and how to move forward. And I just wanted to also um, say that um, that's currently one, um, that's that we're currently one hour and 31 minutes in. I also just want to say that. All right. I <laughs> appreciate that, Kyle, right? Thank but you. yeah, that's, uh, that pretty much uh, concludes uh, this uh, uh, chapter and discussion. Uh, I'm starting to get tired. I've been up uh, 6.30, got off of work, and then had a tenor funeral uh around 11 o'clock today so i'm tired <laughs> mm-hmm. it's so, always awesome having you comrade it's always awesome having you it. here i appreciate it comrade definitely well, definitely thanks for facilitating it is always good to see you man oh yeah absolutely yeah. you too bro <laughs> and it's always good to see you too rob you're an amazing comrade in yourself every single um, <laughs> one of you are you know rob <laughs> um Dharma Re, I believe I pronounce your name. Um, um, sister, um, sister Zen and Comrade Joe, y'all are awesome. I love every single last one of y'all. You know, because we need to show that love in these hard times. You know, as um, as 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 Comrade Che said, you know, um, being revolutionary, um, to, to be a revolutionary is to have a sense of love for humanity and for those right. around you. And Absolutely. y'all are y'all are my brothers and sisters, and I love every single last one of you guys. Absolutely. Same here, comrade. <laughs> mm-hmm. All power and panther love. Panther All love. Power. Appreciate you All guys. Power. Oh, good night. <laughs> good night, everybody. Good night, guys. Good night. See y'all Sunday. All right. <laughs>